So hi, I'm Tara, and I'm uh, program head for pediatric nursing at BCIT. And so um, I came to do this thesis on, on a path of never. I was never going to be a nurse. I was never going to do my master's degree. And I certainly was never going to do any work on um, children with autism. Um, because uh, everybody in my family is a nurse, and then why would I get my master's degree? That's too hard. And then um, I have a child with autism. So I have enough autism in my life, and I didn't want to do that. So um, if you learn nothing else today, don't ever say never. Say never, because never has a way of happening anyway. Um, so we, how I came to do this thesis particularly was I had a, um, a professor, Linda Bellneves, who was running Cameo at the time, which is the Complementary and Alternative Medicine Education and Outcomes Program at the BC Cancer Agency, which I think is somewhere in flux now. I'm not sure what's happening to it. But she was talking about how they give advice to families and parents, uh, or families and um, clients, about complementary alternative medicines, what's out there, um, it was a place for people to go to get information. They didn't advise them what to do or what not to do, but just so they could make better healthcare choices about these things. And I thought, why doesn't this exist for autism? And so um, she said, well, first you need to know, do parents use it? And I thought, well, from my experience, yes, they do, but that's not science, so okay. And then um, she said, then you need to know why. And so thus developed my thesis. And, um, and I was lucky enough to have Dr. Merinda say yes to being on it because when I thought, who in autism is awesome? It was her. So uh, I thought that way she could be the autism piece. So one of the things that we, when I first started doing the research that came up was that complementary and alternative medicine in the studies that were available at the time, and there wasn't a ton, um, it wasn't well defined. A lot of uh, articles and research that had talked about um, CAM also used educational therapies in there as well. And so we wanted to be really clear when we um, did the study of defining what CAM was. And so we used this definition and um, also used their website to pick out what the CAMs were. We sent a questionnaire out to the clients, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, um, to ask them about. And we went to anything we could find, and not just from Canada either, like what is being used in autism and then put that on there as long as it was um, fell under this category. Uh, complementary refers to the use of one in conjunction with conventional medicine and alternative refers to the use of these in place of and in the autism world um, alternative is usually what's used most because there isn't a lot of conjunctional medicine. Um, so one of the things that um, you know, we all, I assume you all know about autism. In addition to the social, behavioral, and communication challenges, um, parents also were looking for ways to mitigate some of the symptoms that are non-diagnostic. And um, they're really not addressed by behavioral treatments. So these were a list of some of the uh, things that moms and, and in the research said that they needed to um, work on. Um, things like um, sleep, that was my favorite. Um, is, uh, was one that was really um, a big one for families, and so was gastrointestinal symptoms, and those came up over and over again in the study. Um, because the underlying condition of autism can't be cured, I mean, if you read the internet it can, but if you don't, then it can't be cured, and so um, it's usually management improvement of these comorbid morbid symptoms that are the focus of CAM. CAM is attractive, um, you know, because they are associated with claims that address or even cure many of the symptoms of autism. And really, if you type CAM and cure on the internet, it will come up. Um, and that's what a lot of parents are doing. Uh, the increased availability of information on the internet, popular information from popular media, I think Jenny McCarthy is like the gold standard of, I said this fit worked and people went crazy for it. And then anecdotal reports, um, ta talking to other parents of children with autism. And um, these are attractive despite the fact that they're unsupported by scientific research. Um, they're often ineffective and they usually are quite expensive. Um, however, because there is a lack of adequate conventional treatment, families are often left to choose CAM treatment because if they don't choose CAM, they choose nothing. So this was, we did some research on why parents use CAM. Again, there wasn't a ton of research out there, but some of the um, theories about why they used it were parental hope, high level of stress, severity of symptoms, um, expectancy of good outcomes, the perceived safety, and uh, that was a really big thing. People think it's safe because it's natural. And then the influence of media attention. Um, all of the theory, all of these theories were, however, atheoretical. There was not really a lot of research behind it. 
Um, so what we do know about families um, when they have children with autism, and this was the research that was out there, was it's a stressful time. There's a lot of guilt um, when trying to cope with their child's needs. Uh, they have a challenge of raising a disabled child in a society that doesn't really value disabled children very much. Um, they have, don't have a lot of financial support. In BC, we're quite lucky, and, um, but that doesn't exist in every province. And I know that parents here think that it's still not enough, but it's better than nothing. Um, and then a lack of social recognition and the feelings of stigma, stigmatization, isolation, and marginalization, and those all came up in our study. So what we didn't know was which therapies were selected by parents, how the decisions were made with regard to those therapies, and the motivation behind the inclusion of CAM. While theoretical framework development has been substantial in, in the decision-making area, um, they haven't, there was no existing theory that, uh, to explain why that happened. So because that's what you want to do in your master's, you come up with a theory. <laughs> so um, CAM decision-making in autism, um, so we wanted to find something that would uh, challenge the existing theoretical frameworks. There are theoretical frameworks available already that explain why people choose CAM, and there are parental decision-making for children in conventional medicine, but there wasn't something that explained both. And because there are significant contextual differences, that was important. Um, some of the contextual differences were that parents are left on their own in autism to make decision treatments. Often in conventional medicine, they're doing it in conjunction with somebody, usually their healthcare provider. Um, parents are, at, are really vulnerable right now. They've just had a huge blow. They've just lost their ideal child and um, they're grieving. So they're quite uh, susceptible to hearing news that will make them want to do other things. And less conventional treatments. Um, CAM, there's no scientific evidence to back them up. So when par people are making decisions about conventional health care, there's usually scientific evidence to say this works. And in CAM, there often isn't. Uh, the diagnosis of autism forces parents to make choices about their children, whether they want to, whether they feel prepared to and making a choice is not perceived as an option. So in order to appropriately explore why parents chose CAM, we needed to do a qualitative uh, research and develop a framework that would describe um, the complexity and factor in the um, contextual factors. And so we wanted to know um, the decision-making process regarding CAM, what belief system and values under underlaid those choices, I don't know if that's the right word, and their expectations related to the outcomes of those treatments. What did they expect that these CAMs would do for their kids? Well, the awesome, well. super exciting methodology part. Um, the qualitative study design, it, we used a grounded theory methodology um, to discover the process. Um, the participants, we used 15 mothers along with two fathers as co-interviewees. Um, the fathers, uh, one father interpreted, his wife was, uh, English was her second language, and so even though she spoke English very well, he helped with some of the words she couldn't find. And then the other father said about three words in the whole interview. So um, it was mostly mothers, and that's not surprising. Mothers make most of the healthcare choices for their children and families. Um, we had participants of various ages. The youngest child was 13, and the oldest was, I want to say 14. And um, no, diverse- The was- Three. Three. Yeah. Third. Oh, three. Sorry. Thinking of my own child. Oh, see. Thirteen. Uh, three. The youngest was three. And um, we wanted a diversity in the severity of the autism. So we had kids who were completely nonverbal to kids who were um, high-functioning Asperger's. Uh, the number and types of CAM tried, we had, they had to have tried at least two. And um, we had some parents who checked off just about every CAM on there, so we had a good variety. Uh, various, so, various socioeconomic groups, ethnic groups, and we tried to um, go outside the lower mainland, so we interviewed some people from around BC as well. Um, the study samples drawn from parents who participated in um, various autism programs, we approached them, and that was used to initially recruit people, and then we also used some snowballing. Um, we had one mother who has a disability newsletter. She sends out an email. She sent that out. It went to a um, naturopath who, had, who did CAM for children with autism. She sent it out to her whole client base, so we had lots of participants from that as well. And then this was the inclusion um, criteria. They had to have a child between the ages of 2 and 16, have tried at least one CAM therapy, live in BC, and speak and understand English. Uh, the data was collected. We did an online questionnaire to collect demographic data um, and mostly information about the types of CAM therapies selected by their parents. And this was not, um, the data collected in this was not really to tell us about them specifically. I mean, we found out like parents of children with more 
kids had, you know, they had one or more children with autism, that sort of thing. Um, but what we really wanted to do was a qualitative um, research. So we did semi-structured in-depth interviews after we got those, and the interviews lasted for about an hour to two hours. Um, one mother, I was like, hey, I have to go now. <laughs> I was like, stop talking. But uh, she just wanted to chat after that. So, uh, the findings. The course construct that emerged from this study was fighting from the fringes. And this concept describes the decision-making process of mothers. Um, the fighting from the fringe theme captured the way in the mothers and studies coped with the diagnostic experience, which was um, pretty traumatic for most people, uh, how they sought information and how they selected CAM therapies and validated those choices. Um, we call it fighting from the fringes because mothers felt they were pushed to the fringe and that was um, one of the mothers in the study had said I feel like I'm on I'm fighting from the fringes and so that's how we came up with that title and that um, that word fighting came up over and over and over again in the study it was part of their advocating it was part of how they felt that they had to fight against um, health practitioners, society, autism itself, that kind of kept coming up and up. So mothers felt they were pushed to the fringe by their lack of acknowledgement of their needs, an invalidation of their beliefs about CAM, their concern about their children not being addressed, and the consequence of their child's diagnosis. This is the beautiful diagram I made. Um, so in, in the diagram you can see it's all these decision making are happening in the context of stress and isolation, that's the big blue circle. So in the, it happens in two sections. The first section is a disenfranchisement, and we'll talk about that more. Parents go through something is not right. Um, they kind of know there's something wrong with their kid. They go to conventional medicine. They go back and forth quite a bit. They are searching for answers. Again, that's going back and forth. The seeking information happens throughout the whole process. Uh, they begin to identify goals. They look for alternatives. There's a skinny arrow that goes all the way back. Once they've found alternatives, they go back to conventional medicine, and the slashes in there represent the fact that it is a one-way street. They go back to their conventional practitioners, say, hey, I found all this CAM, and the conventional practitioners are quite dismissive, and we'll talk about that more later too. And then they have filtering factors, CAM providers, social network, I'll talk specifically about those. They make a choice in the evaluation. Captured in the core construct um, are the limited treatment options within conventional health care, the need for mothers to search for alternative therapies, and the context of stress, stress and isolation as a consequence of autism and the diagnostic process. Um, three key processes happen. They search for answers, they look for alternatives, and they make a choice. In the context of the decision-making process, uh, two major concepts were recurrent in the stories of what it was like to live with autism, and that's stress and isolation. And we knew this before we started the study that um, stress and isolation um, is occurring in parents of children with autism, but it really came up again and again here. Um, what caused most of the mother's stress was their children's behaviors and the feelings that they experienced because of them. Um, because they, these experiences were so interwoven with why they chose CAM, they really talked a lot about that um, and what it was like to live with their children. Um, they were reluctant to talk negatively about their children. They didn't want to seem like um, they didn't love their children or that this was a problem or that they couldn't cope, but um, they just wanted people to understand what it was really like. They wanted other people to get it. Um, so the behaviors is, was the number one reason. And these are some of the words that the mothers used to describe. Uh, anything you see in quotes in this presentation is um, the words of the mothers in the study. They also found it difficult with communication to understand their children's needs and correctly pro believe that their children's um, inability to express themselves was probably part of their behaviors. And they talked about how hard it was just to do day-to-day -day things, how to get to the grocery store, get their other kids to school, get out, how, give a kid a meal, a bath, brush their teeth. These things were very stressful for them. And again, this is a mom who tries to describe what she's doing and that her day looks great right now. She's trying to tell me, but if, to, if he went sideways, that the whole day would be a disaster. And this was a mother of an eight-year-old who described what it was like to have her son who had, would have a full-blown full blown meltdown, she called it, for hours at a time. The longest, she said, was four hours that it lasted. And um, so this is how she would kind of cope. Um, it was 
it was a real privilege to have the mothers talk to me about this. And I think that, and this is kind of an aside, but one of the limitations of the study that we put in there was that I am a mother of a child with autism myself. And so was that a bias? And so I really had to be careful of that. But it was also, um, a, it was also a good thing because mothers trusted me. They trusted me to know that I understood what was happening in their lives. And as we see later with that disenfranchisement from the healthcare system, that was even more important because they really don't trust, they wouldn't have trusted me just as a nurse, but they trusted me because I was the mother of a child with autism, that I wasn't gonna judge them. And then the second major concept that's recurrent is isolation. And all of the mothers who participated in the study spoke honestly about how lonely it was to parent a child with autism. Um, and again, these are the words that they used, and that other people didn't understand what that was like. Um, and this lack of understanding made them reluctant to discuss their child's autism, and for some mothers, even disclose it. I don't, I, I don't know how you wouldn't do that, but or couldn't do that. But um, and then also, they felt isolated from their friends and family as well. Um, a lot of families, they felt that their families judged them. Their parents didn't understand, and so that made them feel even more isolated. And um, the, of course, all of this left them feeling angry, embarrassed, and misunderstood. Um, they're trying to fit themselves and their child into a world that doesn't accommodate their often uh, extreme sensory beliefs and behavior issues that accompany autism. Um, and also the reaction of people to this behavior. And the mothers did talk a lot about what it was like to be at the store. And they said, you know, your two-year-old's having a temper tantrum. Eh when your eight-year-old's having a temper tantrum. And, she said, and people will say things to the parents. They would say things like, you need to control your child or you're a bad mother or that sort of thing, which you know, they found to be horrible. And so a lot of mothers were going out less and less with their child. And of course, that increases their isolation. The mothers also shared um, being isolated from their child because their child were, were hard to connect to sometimes. Um, and these were the words that they um, said. So of course, you have a child who you love and can't get near. And they felt that they were excluded. So this is one of the mums. Well, all the mothers in this study talked about how hard it was to have a child with autism and how difficult it was to parent them. They all felt they needed to move forward and they had a responsibility to look after their child. So it was like, yep, okay, this kind of sucks, but we have to get on with it because I owe it to my child. And that came through in every single mother in the study. So the three decision-making processes that we'll talk about are searching for answers, nothing we can do, and making a choice. Searching for answers. Um, mothers struggled to find um, answers about the causes and symptoms and behaviors their child exhibited. And most of the mothers recognized that something was, something was not right with their children, usually between the ages of one and two years. And they would go to their family physician and say, my kid is got diarrhea or constipation or uh, uh, is not talking or only likes to play, lay on the floor and play with his cars or um, that sort of thing. And so they knew something was not right. They weren't specific. And none of them thought at one that it was autism, but um, they knew that something was wrong. And so these are some of the uh, issues that came up um, and usually went and saw their family doctors. Some went and saw um, members of infant development teams, or they would go and see speech language th therapists or the nurse. So it's important for, for people out in the community to start hearing some of that too, is that um, it's not just the family doctor they're gonna see. The majority of mothers told so stories of a continuous cycle of misdiagnosis. Um, you know, oh, your child has constipation, or your child has this sort of thing. Um, and, um, Dis and the dismissal of those symptoms, that they were not, don't worry about it, it's gonna be okay, it's nothing, you know, that sort of thing. And to be fair, you know, I think most physicians would, you know, if you had a child came in and, and said, oh, my child has GI problems, they wouldn't go autism. So it, uh, and this was really happened a lot, as the, especially if the children were young. Um, however, this disregard of their apprehensions um, played a pivotal role in the mother's disengagement from conventional healthcare medicine. Um, the healthcare providers they felt were no, no longer somebody they could go to for answers, but somebody they had to fight against to get answers. Um, and it's important to know that between the suspicion of autism and the official diagnosis, that many mothers started to engage in that information seeking process. They were like, okay, you don't know what's wrong, so I'm gonna start looking. Um, for many families, uh, it was repeated visits to the family doctors and pediatricians before a possible, a probable diagnosis of autism was made. And even then, when, 
once they had been to their family doctor for the diagnosis, they still had to wait for the official diagnosis. And the waiting list on that at the time we did the study was about two years. So um, that coupled with the fact that they then hear earlier is better, the sooner the better, the sooner treatment can start, the better, um, really increased the parents' stress as well. And um, then or else parents went with private and a lot of parents did go privately that could afford it. But then that is ex quite expensive as well. Um, the exact timelines for uh, diagnostic process varied but the experience was universal that having a child diagnosed with autism is devastating. Um, and this is what one mom talks about her, her experience. Um, all the mothers were told there was little that they could do um, for their children and they felt they were told to kind of abandon help for hope for their child's future or at least limit it. And, um, because beyond educational interventions, which were effective, really effective for some children and not so effective for other children, there wasn't very much they could do. And because they were waiting for that official diagnosis to come as well, that those educational interventions weren't always available to them yet, they didn't really know even wh where to find them. Um, most of the mothers in the study recalled the anguish of getting the diagnosis, but they didn't really focus on that period of life. Most of the parents' children had been diagnosed a year, the three-year-old had been diagnosed the year before, but the rest of the kids, it had happened several years ago, so they had moved on past that. They had shared their experience, but it wasn't what they were experiencing in the moment. Um, having their child written off was unacceptable to these mothers, and um, doing nothing was not an option. So the mothers continued to seek information and look for answers. And um, they started doing this research on their own. Educational, so they had to identify their goals. So educational treatments, uh, uh, all of them except for two families chose educational treatments. And we asked them about this and because often the decision making for educational treatments and decision making for CAM were happening at the same time. Um, but it, so it offered help in the areas of communication, behavior and social skills, but it didn't address all the other concerns that often accompany autism. And we talked about those earlier. Um, most of the mothers always felt their children would have autism. Um, so well, their goals were to increase their ability as a child to learn, to appear normal, and to fit into the world. Um, the goal of the treatment wasn't to cure, but to help improve their child's quality of life. Um, for a small number of mothers in the study, their goal was to cure autism. And they, these mothers tried the greatest number of CAM therapies and the most experimental and extreme CAM therapies. And some of the mothers tried like stem cell transplants and bone marrow transplants and had gone to Russia to do it and um, incurred a huge cost. So that mother who, to be fair to her, had three children with autism. Um, and so she has that stress and isolation times three. Um, but they were, because they thought they could cure it, they were gonna try the most things. How many were in the cure category? Two parents. And one mother had three kids and one mother had two. Wow. Yeah. And none of their kids were cured yet. Um, looking for alternatives. So because there's nothing in conventional care, um, once they had diagnosis they, and um, the limitations of conventional medicine had been reached and the education therapies had been started, the mothers became um, more determined to find treatment options and potential positive outcomes. So sources of information. Um, so this was one, one of the moms said. All right. So the number one source of information for parents was anecdotal evidence. Um, uh, they got that mostly from the internet. And also from books of par other parents who'd had children with autism and usually those books had talked about how they had miraculous results um, with what they did. And some of those books were the educational therapies. We did ABA, we did that sort of thing. And other ones were we did a gluten-free diet or we did this or did that or, uh, you know, um, uh, chitculation therapy, that sort of thing. The parents in this study valued other parents' treatment information and because they valued their experience um, of having a child with autism because they got it. And so that helped um, alleviate some of the isolation and stigmatization for them. They also sought advice for conventional medicine, books written by doctors, mostly psychiatrists and psychologists, and those trusted to have extraordinary knowledge of autism and treatments. Um, 
Despite the use of anecdotal evidence to source information, all of the mothers really expressed a desire to obtain expert advice um, on their decision-making process. Um, so the mothers get the information, they sought advice, um, then they went back and sought advice from their physicians. Um, and they went back there because, for these reasons, um, they had read about these CAMs, they sounded amazing, they're gonna go back to their doctor and say, okay, look, this is the research I've done. And um, because they, and the reasons they said they went back where they felt they didn't understand the credibility of the information, there is an overwhelming amount of information. Um, not all of it agrees with each other. Uh, the sources are kind of questionable. Um, and then even papers that were written to look like real research, that is difficult to read for a lay person and to understand. And it looks sciencey, so it must be true. Um, and so they wanted to go back and confirm if that was. Um, and this was what the mother said, some of the mothers said about how they were um, met with that to where they wanted to discuss CAM with their doctors. They didn't, they didn't like that. <laughs> um, and this caused the mothers to feel disenfranchised. So they're already feeling a bit disenfranchised because they've gone to the doctor with their small child. They've said, there's something wrong with my kid. Eh, there is, there isn't. Maybe, well, mm, finally get around to, see, I knew there was something wrong with my kid. My kid has autism. And then they go back to say, okay, now we're going to fix my kid with autism because you haven't been able to offer me any way to help my child. I'm going to come back. This is what I'm going to do. And um, this is kind of that final step in disenfranchisement for them because there's nothing you can do and you're stupid for trying. Uh, that made them go, okay, we're done with you now. Um, and that condescension was a real problem for them. And this was particularly egregious because the mothers had been left alone to find the answers and they felt that was really harmful. Um, so this, again, cyclical patterns of di misdiagnosis, dismissed concerns, and then um, mothers were unconvinced about conventional medicine's ability to help them, or even their desire to help them. And again, that's one mom. So even though um, a lot of the mothers had started using CAM before they went to CAM providers, they were still looking for that level of expertise. And so they started to talk to CAM providers. Um, the one CAM provider that all of the mothers were seeing, and again, I didn't discover this until we were in the study, um, was the same person and she had a child with autism and they liked that a lot because not only did she understand the CAM and what they were doing but she also had a kid with autism so she really would get what they were after. And um, But the most important thing for her was not they, what they were offering to her but that they were offering information and they were partner, partnering in the decision making. And the mothers didn't acquiesce um, Earlier, the mothers had kind of said, if the doctor told me to do something, I'd do it, and I wouldn't question it. But now the mothers still questioned everything that the CAM providers, because they, they now felt empowered to advocate for their child. So that was one good thing that came out of the way they were treated. Um, and they were supported in a non-judgmental way, and it validated their capacity as mothers to make good choices for their children. Factors that influence the use of CAM, so uh, emotion, personal beliefs, values, intuition, or gut feelings, cost of treatments, both financially and personally. Um, so cost of treatment, how long would it take? Sometimes uh, families had started a CAM therapy and stopped because it was too labor intensive. So the cost to them personally was high. Um, potential risk and risk, uh, everybody's risk tolerance was different. Um, you know, for the one mother who had the stem cell transplant, it wasn't a big deal. Other mothers were like, uh, gluten-free diet, that's all I'm doing. Um, credibility of the source of information, if they felt the source was credible. Um, their personal experiences with CAM, and in that I meant uh, the mothers had used CAM themselves personally, um, or had used it for other members of their family before, and not just for autism. And then the fit with their family's values um, and beliefs. There was one that came up in every single mother's thing and of course I think we can still see that this is happening now um, that vaccinations were wholly or partially responsible for their children's autism. They all believe that? Yeah. Really? Even though they understood that the, and a lot of because I probed that a bit and even though the mothers understood that it was um, there was a genetic link probably and uh, that um, that vaccinations were not um, there was no link, there was no science that proved it. Um, the idea was firmly entrenched. They were still believing that. Um, and this, uh, the vaccinations um, 
of course, this didn't help with their belief in conventional health care because we had told them that getting vaccines were safe and then look what we did to their kid. And this was one mom who was quite extreme. She didn't even think that her kids actually had autism. <clears throat> this is the mom, stem cell mom, three kids mom. Um, so, uh, and even, so, even the moms who were less extreme, so that was the most extreme mom. She believed that it was, in fact, a, a, an autism, a, an injury from um, vaccines and not autism. This was a mother who uh, said, I don't really believe vaccines cause autism, but then she didn't um, vaccinate her other children because she didn't want to take a chance. So even though she said she didn't think it did, her behavior says, but I don't trust it, so I'm not going to do it because I think it might. So, um, and that's how she rationalized it. It was like, yeah. And um, of course, the strongly held belief that um, about the cause of autism influenced these mother's choices. And a component of vaccine had caused autism, so it, the rationale was that something in CAM could remove that and therefore cure the autism. And of course, that, that belief about the vaccines being a cause of autism was validated in a lot of the research that they found and the stuff they found on the internet. And so it was like, okay, we're making the right decision and this must be it. And science is lying to us. And because you're already disenfranchised from the regular healthcare system and you don't really trust them and you've had a really bad experience with them, why would they be telling us the truth? So it was a very multi-layered kind of thing. Um, so they also got information from their social work, uh, so, social network, um, families, friends, other groups. Uh, you know, oh, my daughter's sister had that, and she tried butter and put him on the full moon, and that were so. There was a lot of that as well. So once all the possible camp therapies were assessed and the various factors considered, parents then proceeded to the next phase, which was actually selecting a camp therapy for their children. So making a choice, and again, then one mother said, you made that choice, you had to make a choice. Um, and again, another mother. So lack of direction and support from conventional medicine meant that these mothers are making these decisions alone. Um, I mean, often they made them in conjunction with their partner, but um, they didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about that because I suspect that the mothers made most of the choices themselves. Um, and the burden of having to make this choice alone, of course, compounds those feelings of stress and isolation. Um, the choices were mostly based on whether they thought it would work, the hope that it would work, and to pursue every option. Um, guilt, uh, avoidance of guilt was a powerful motivator. They wanted to make sure that they would try everything. So the evaluation, after they've made a choice, then they evaluate, you know, does it work? This was one mother's experience. And yay, it works. Um, so even though initial goals were not fully realized, uh, the mothers weren't discouraged because they saw the treatment as an ongoing process. Um, and every mother in the study felt that the CAMS had worked for them. Um, the children's symptoms and behaviors were improved from the mother's perspective. Um, and sometimes they had got external validation. So a teacher at school or an aide or somebody would say, oh, you know, he seems to be doing better. Um, and um, the mothers perceived the claims about the camp therapies were valid and they got positive feedback from everybody else. Um, despite the success, the mothers reported a conflict in their fight. Of course, this is where they have that juxtaposition of they're trying to f have fit in and have their child fit in, and yet they're using a treatment choice that exists on the fringes of healthcare. And so there was that real rub. Um, they were also reluctant to tell people about their CAM treatments they had chosen. Um, this is a mother whose um, son didn't sleep through the night um, for nine years um, and then finally did. And she said, I don't care for the science of how it works or why it works, it works. And I have to say that having my son not sleep for two years, I don't know how that kid's still alive. And um, so, <laughs> so, you know, but she didn't want to tell anybody because she had been so derided for her choices. Um, but they all the mothers got had reached a point where um, they really didn't care if other people thought what they were doing was okay, um, as particularly their doctors, because I don't care what you think. This works for me. It's making my child happy. Um, so uh, this was our 
theory we got to facing opposition, the mothers persevered and they um, emerged from their experiences, the fighting from the fringe concept. All right, so we get to the discussion part. This, this um, theory provides a way to understand the thought processes um, for mothers' decisions to use CAM. And um, it also helped the mothers maintain themselves and their self-image as good mothers. Um, so all the mothers believed their children could change with CAM and educational be behave, uh, behavior therapy, and that's important. Um, CAM use can be seen not just as a maladaptive um, um, factor, but as a factor of protective factor for the mothers. Um, parents that saw their children in a positive light and believed their autistic children could change were more likely to utilize interventions as a, than those that did not, and that included educational interventions. Um, a belief that interventions would be successful was linked with a reduction in maternal stress, and higher levels of hope and optimism were associated with less depression, more adaptive coping skills, and greater health outcomes. And those was the research that was out there already. Um, so investigation and use of CAM treatment options um, that they can administer, themse administer themselves, that they can do something, is going to help them cope better with this child. And it allowed to take them, parents to take on these challenges of raising this child and kept them motivated. Uh, and this is important because mother and children's relationship is bi-directional. And so the more stress and isolation the mother experiences, the worse the behaviors are going to be of the child. And, and then the worse the behaviors are of the child, the more stressed and isolated the mother becomes. So uh, some alleviation of the stress and isolation was important. Um, because that stress is bad for children's developing brains and bad for their mothers. And also to keep in mind that mothers of children with autism who experience stress also have jobs and marriages and other children. And so that they already are up here at the stress level and more stress on top of that means that their coping skills may not be as good. Mine are excellent, but not everybody's are. I have a lot of support in my life and that makes a huge difference. Um, the diagnostic process. So I think we've already touched on this quite a bit, but the diagnostic process was really um, important and there needs to be some changes to the, how children with autism are diagnosed. Mostly it needs to be faster. Uh, but disenfranchisement from the healthcare system was a number one factor, a huge contributing factor to why parents chose CAM. Um, and uh, it also has an impact on conventional healthcare providers' ability to monitor and participate in the health and well-being of their patients and their families. And so that needs to change. Um, all of the studies, mums experienced negative interactions with conventional health care. Some then found other doctors who were good and better and were willing to discuss things, but it was still, that trust was broken forever. They never really kind of got back there again with them. Um, and. Uh, the, this, that it changed the way the mothers felt about the relationship with the system as a whole um, and forever. And a mothers reported having to fight for about their experience, competency and expertise about their child, having recognized and valued. And as a nurse, you know, and a pediatric nurse, we really come from a perspective of family-centered care, which means that the family is important, the child is, lives in the context of that family, and so, and the parents are the experts on their children. And so, really, that needs to, um, come through here and it hasn't. Um, and mothers really wanted to be, avoid being labeled um, as desperate or illogical or as one of the moms said, one of those mothers um, because they found those judgments to be really disempowering for them. And the results, those results we found were consistent with other studies. Um, mothers wanted their motivations to be seen not as um, you know, a pathological delusion but a way of they were trying to help their children. CAM let mothers have options to normalize their child um, as much as possible, to find relief from stress and isolation, and to self-identify as a good mother, and really importantly, to have others identify them as a good mother, because they were doing something. Um, the study showed that uh, support was wanted. Um, really, they wanted shared decision making that may never happen, but um, they wanted to at least be able to collaborate with their conventional health care provider. Um, and they wanted to at least get consent of their physician to um, that they could, they're not their blessing, but you know, kind of like, yeah, go ahead. If you want to look at that, I think that's a great idea. And then they wanted professional guidance. 
And the professional guidance didn't have to come from their healthcare provider, it could, but they wanted somebody to help them in that decision-making process. And so the research shows that formal support groups and less structured social supports help reduce the stress and isolation. Um, those professional supports are important to help parents and collaborative partnerships yield more positive outcomes. So the mothers were right to want that. Um, CAM providers, one of the things that we can learn is that CAM providers, what CAM providers offered, not so much what they offered, but how they offered it. Um, they offered expertise about CAM treatment. So they didn't, of course, the problem with CAM providers is they often will say that these things will work without scientific research. However, they spent time listening and validating the mother's concerns, and that was important. Um, we could also learn that they saw the autism symptoms, um, but tried to look at the family as a whole. How did the child's autism symptoms impact the whole family? And that was important. And offered, afforded them communication, sensitivity, compassion, and options um, that had been absent in other relationships with conventional health care providers. And of course, we need to be uh, understanding, you know, I'm a big fan of being a nurse. I'm a big fan of science and research and evidence-based practice. And so why this lack of support um, from conventional health care practitioners occurred um, is, is crucial to understanding how we can move forward. Um, CAM has no, a very few scientific research on most of the CAMs. I think there's a few studies now being done on gluten-based, gluten-free diets, whether or not they work. I think the latest one I heard was that they don't um, make any difference. Um, but um, so that it's hard for doctors because doctors have an obligation to provide evidence-based ethical, uh, you know, uh, research to their clients when to help them with the decision making. And so um, because that's not available, they can't do that. Um, but healthcare practitioners in other studies did acknowledge that they have a responsibility to engage, but they found that education, lack of personal experience, and knowledge about CAMs were barriers. So maybe they could learn something about that in medical school. That'd be good. So I thought this was a good um, a statement that I liked, um, that all children require a medical home. Um, I'm not a fan of the word medical, but they, you know, uh, a health home maybe to look after all of the things and look after the family as a whole. Um, so the Academy of American Pediatrics offers some ways that um, physicians should be and pediatricians should be dealing with um, children and families of, with autism and using a respectful, open, sensitive communication, um, even if their ideas are not the same. Um, that other recommendations um, for empowering the patient um, about CAM inquire, acquiring about CAM use. Ask them, are they using it? Because for some children, you know, and some of the extreme therapies can be quite dangerous. And so not knowing about those is not doing a service to your patient. Um, using respectful and non-judgmental approach and listening. Um, understanding the patient's reasons and goals for CAM treatment. Um, that was important, understanding why, because most of the mothers, and I had thought going into the study that most of the mothers say, well, I'm hoping to cure my children. And in fact, that wasn't the case. They just wanted to improve some of the symptoms. And really underlying all of that was, my child doesn't sleep, or my child has diarrhea all the time, or my child. And so listening to what they were trying to fix with that, and was there something we could be doing to help them with that, um, besides doing something weird and that doesn't work. Um, and engaging in communication with the patient's CAM practitioner is a way of building a multidisciplinary team. Um, for some families, they felt that was really important. They wanted to be able to build a team with their BIs and their behavior therapists and their, uh, their aides and anybody else who was involved in the child's life to make that team so they could kind of talk about how these things were working. We can dream. We can dream. <laughs> um, and so conventional healthcare practitioners need increased education to identify early signs and symptoms of autism. Most children are diagnosed still at the boat at the age of three, and that could probably, but they can see symptoms pretty clearly by about one and a half, two years old. Um, and again, it depends on the kid. Some kids weren't diagnosed until they were six because they have some, it's not as clear. Um, to take parents' concerns and fears seriously, uh, when a parent comes in and says, there's something wrong with my kid, 
most of the time there probably is. Some parents are a little weird and there's nothing, but um, it's worth, it's not worth dismissing because they could miss something. Um, to educate themselves about the supports and resources available. Again, because mothers are um, coming in and they may or may not know where to find things, the doctors need to know where to send them for services. And the services that talk about, that will service the family as a whole, not just the child. And then understanding the choices that are available, you know, educating yourself on what is out on the internet, what is, like, you know, we could all dismiss Jenny McCarthy as Playboy Bunny, what the hell does she know, but wow, people believed her, you know. Um, there's an interesting article that just came out uh, the other day, I think it's a book that's been written called, Is Gwyneth Paltrow Making You Sick? And because we have the, we're kind of starting to believe celebrities over science, and we're losing our ability to think critically about these things. So being aware that that is a pretty powerful thing. Um, and then also to know that autism diagnosis, that time is extremely stressful for parents and um, they may need additional supports and services. Uh, parents' desire to try CAM therapies and its belief in its work is not maladaptive, but in fact may be a way of moderating stress for them and may be in fact a healthy way for them to deal with their child's illness. Um, the critical role that they play following diagnosis um, as an educator and somebody who integrates care, it's not enough for a practitioner to just give the diagnosis and then disappear under the child's life, and that does happen quite frequently. Um, and then parents wanted an opportunity to follow up after the initial diagnosis to kind of, once they'd absorbed the shock, to kind of come back and ask questions again later. Um, we also found that although patients want information uh, and choice, they don't want to be solely responsible for enacting those choices. Um, they want, to opt again, opportunity to ask questions at the time of diagnosis and again later. And they want feedback from um, conventional health care practitioners about CAM treatments. You know, and even the ability to say, um, you know, there isn't scientific evidence for this. However, if you want to try it, there doesn't seem to be anything that says this is harmful either. You know, and then um, it would be nice too if healthcare providers then started to do some research around these things too. Um, and healthcare providers need to be aware that a mother's first experience with them will uh, set the tone for all the future encounters. Um, and that mothers will be reluctant to discuss their own needs. They're gonna wanna talk about what's wrong with their kid and they're fine. And um, often they're not fine. And um, that mother's used to, choice to use CAM was motivated by their need to be a good mom. Um, until these changes occur, children with autism in their families and CAM therapies they choose will remain on the margins of healthcare and society. Um, what the mothers in the study needed information about was CAM, parental support groups, autism professionals, coordination of service, and increased education about autism for health professionals. Um, so some of the things that exist now that are pretty awesome for CAM therapy, the Australian government Department of Families, Housing, Community Services, and Indigenous Affairs, they have a big umbrella there. Um, they have a website that actually has um, CAM therapies on it. it it's all, it has all kinds of things, then it has an autism section, which I thought was great. And um, it talks about all of the CAM therapies that they know about and are available, and they don't say it works or doesn't work, they don't, but they, is there scientific evidence? How high is the risk? You know, and so there's a good solid place for parents to go to find information that is not somebody trying to sell them something, somebody trying to get them on board with some, you know, um, I like to call cult of autism. Um, a development, I would like to see the development of an online central database um, for CAM information so that families could go again to find some place that was something was unbiased and um, just gave them the information that was available. If there's research available, what we know about it, what we don't know about it. Um, it's just information, but it's information coming from a safe place. And so, of course, Cameo. Um, so something like that would be beneficial to address the needs of autistic families in BC. And someday, if I have time, I will develop it. Um, there's a new autism center starting up, Pacific Autism Center. I um, someday may actually get over there and say, hey, how would you like to run something like this? Because I think that would be probably a good home for it. So it was the intention of the study that the theory would emerge that would allow for a clear understanding of how parents of children with autism choose CAM therapies. And um, we then utilized grounded theory and came up with fighting from the fringes. 
Um, my hope for this study was that it will increase awareness about the decision-making process related to CAM and enhance healthcare providers' understanding of this phenomenon. Um, ideally, it would also influence healthcare providers, um, all of us, to follow recommendations of the studies that have been out there and offer support and education to families. And that is my little monkey. And, uh, and I like this thing. You know, one of the things that they said about uh, uh, CAM was like, it's hope. And there's no such thing as false hope. There's only hope. And I like that saying, so that's it. <laughs>